All right, after Shaq's TV, we're back with another episode where we feature some of the best underground hard rock and metal bands across the globe. And today, we'd like to welcome to the show from 70s Psychedelic Doom Star Wars, Great Baiters. We got guitarist Jarrett joining us. What's up, Jarrett? How you doing, man? I see you're uh, hard at work right now. Uh, how's yeah, everything going, right? <laughs> We're moving a bunch of shit, man. <laughs> nice, uh, cool, man. All yeah. right, dude. Yeah, let's get into it. So you can, uh, we can get this. Just knock this out, man. Let's get into it. The new LP, Rock and Roll Fetish. It's out now on Seeing Red Records. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, man. Rock and metal fans are no doubt going to be, I think, Seeing Red once they listen to this album because, I mean, the the word that comes to my mind when I'm listening to it is it's a fiery record, not mm -hmm. a raging fire, but a nice steady slow burn. You know, dirty as fuck, sludgy. 70s psychedelic proto explosion man so um you know it takes me back to the good old days man when rock wasn't so clean and watered yeah. down and you know from the digital stuff so uh so let me just start things off man i mean i guess just start us off with talking about what inspired you guys to channel that golden era of the 70s in terms of not just the music but the uh, presentation as a whole as a band yeah uh well it kind of all started with the the bassist and I used to play in this other band. Um, it was a very like kind of proto punk. Um, so we were okay. kind of at that spot where, you know, it was like surfy and proto punk. Um, so we were already kind of used to just digging into like, just past like, you know, the, the most well-known, I guess, uh, artists within like a genre and okay. kind of digging into more of like the pioneers that kind of, uh, led the way into like what would be these like mammoth, uh, genres of music um mm -hmm. so at some point we were writing shit that was just a little too heavy for that band you know so we were like this actually is a whole whole different kind of world of music um mm -hmm. we ended up hearing uh numero groups acid nightmares compilation um okay. around that time which you know we had benjamin morrow who did the artwork for that do the artwork okay. for rock and roll fetish nice um it's fucking awesome. It's kind of a dream great. come true for all of us, right? Yeah, it's great, great uh, graphics. Absolutely, Ben. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, we heard that that compilation. We were like, we just want to, we're going to have a band that sounds like this, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, we don't have to just be another kind of <laughs> Sabbath derivative band within this genre, but kind of mm -hmm. uh, pay attention more to like bands that would have opened for Sabbath or would have been contemporaries. You know, mm. yeah, no doubt, man. You guys, and I think that's exactly what you sound like. Now, as yeah. a band too, who's embraced, you know, that era of music. You know, a lot of a lot of people in that in the music community, journalists, artists, what have you, they sometimes tend to refer to and use the word retro when they're describing sort of this modern day sound of bands who are, have that you know that early seventies influence. Do you consider yourselves to be a quote unquote retro band, or is that a term that you prefer not to be thrown around when you're talking about the great bands? Um, I don't know. I feel like everybody's kind of entitled to whatever the fuck they want to say about okay, it. Okay, sure. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think any of us really feel any certain way. Um, we've heard it all at this point, you know. Okay. But we're just mm -hmm. kind of like, like some like deadbeat revival band, or that we are the second coming of proto metal or whatever. I, I don't mm -hmm. believe that. But you know, it's it's. Uh, I don't think it's a big deal to be called that. I mean, we definitely used uh, old school techniques when it came to recording and also just using all like vintage gear for the most part as well mm -hmm. just to kind of capture those tones and also i feel like using that stuff like it all kind of has its own character and, and mojo and mystique so sometimes you just kind of plug into an old piece of gear and, and the shit just writes itself sure a rip, absolutely well let's get into what you t what you're here for okay uh let's, let's talk about it man this monstrosity of a record is called rock and roll fetish uh, it's your guy's sophomore release, your debut full length. And this is, man, this is a marathon of a record. I mean, 81 <laughs> minutes long, man. That is, and I'll tell you, you know, it doesn't sound like that, man. I mean, it really flows so nicely. You don't even notice that it's that long. But the one thing you do notice is this, I mean, the sonic nature and, you know, and, and the vintage sound of the album is just, it's really, uh, you know, it's over the top, man. I mean, and I, obviously that's attributed to the fact that I also uh, believe that the album was recorded live to tape via analog. So that, of course, gives it, of course, that vintage sound. So talk a little bit about the analog recording process that you use and just the experience of, of doing that way compared to, you know, doing it digitally, which, we're, you know, what most bands are doing. Yeah. Um, I guess a lot of it kind of had to go in. I mean, aside from just 
just the limitations of doing things live and then having to like nail perfect takes. Like some songs would take five takes, seven takes. Some I know we worked on like 14. Um, and you don't want to punch in the times that we try to do any kind of punch ins. Like it just didn't, that stuff like sticks out like a sore thumb, mm. you know? And I feel like with digital, you can get away with kind of using that as a crutch. Um, I'm not going to call people lazy, but it's just, a, it, it's a different challenge, I guess. And if you can kind of rely on always having that resource, that resource um, to kind of rely on, I mean, you're, you're, you're kind of also limiting the, the type of challenge, I guess you can put yourself under. So for us, it was like, let's get at, to the studio at like 10 in the morning and record for 12, 14 hours. And it's just playing straight through the songs um, each time. And sometimes there'd be issues with the tape machine and, and we'd have to stop and we'd be feeling uh, a take and stuff. So I feel like all of that kind of builds like a lot of tension that kind of comes off better uh, mm -hmm. in a track. And I think it makes it a lot more interesting, at least like to listen back. Uh, Cause I think if we just did multi-tracking in a basement or something, it would have been a completely different album. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, man. Well, before we go to the next question here, we've got a couple more guys joining us here from the band. What's going on, guys? What's up, hey, dude? What's up, man? What's up, man? Uh, welcome to Hell the show, yeah. guys. Appreciate you doing it, man. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I, you know, I was just talking uh, to Jared here about, you know, the recording analog. Um, now, could you guys see yourselves, I mean, and the band, I mean, ever recording any other way than how you did it on this record, you know, going forward? Or is this just the way this band's going to record no matter what? <laughs> it might be nice to try something else. That that was a crazy experience, man. It Definitely had us. Nice. Yeah, like, you know, like just more creative power with overdubs would be cool potentially. But like, mm -hmm. I love that we captured it all live, and I think the core of everything, like, like the magic happens live. I think it should retain at least the live aspect and the core of it. Yep. Yeah. Dude. Sure. No, absolutely. Well, let's talk about the, you know, uh, let's talk about the, some of the singles that you guys have put out so far, including videos for, I guess we'll start with the track, Tall Man Cometh. I mean, great video filmed at the legendary Sun Records in Memphis, Tennessee, obviously home of Elvis, Johnny Cash, just a whole shitload of, you know, great musicians over the years, rock and uh, old school rock and roll bands and, and artists. Um, talk a little bit about that video shoots and just how really inspirational it must have been and felt just being in that room and building where all those artists i mentioned recorded their iconic you know and classic tracks all the years what was, what was the energy like in there i mean was, did you get a feel in there that so, like a feel you've never had before when you were recording or doing the video show just by being such a, a, a just a, an awesome you know old school classic uh place like sun records um yeah it could have also had something to do with the fact that it was 4 a.m we just finished 10 days of recording <laughs> Um, <laughs> okay but yeah i also had to cut my my video i was getting some looks from the guys they're like yo pick some shit up um, <laughs> so yeah i mean i don't know that was that was pretty awesome and getting to play like old gear that was just sitting in there and kind of looking around at like photos of johnny cash and and elvis while we're just like making this super blasphemous sound in this holy room <laughs> 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 and, when, and that song that ridiculous song we recorded too that just never it never got released man oh yeah so one day we have an <laughs> unreleased song recorded in some at like 5 a.m whatever it was <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Late, dude. We wrote so you guys song. actually record you wrote a song in there okay very cool yeah we, it's it's you know some like south park humor stuff about these like <laughs> Mennonites at this place we stayed in in Arkansas. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it'll probably what? never get released.
Cool. Let's talk about the second single uh, and the first track off the album, Ghost of All. I mean, two things that stick out to me on that track. First is obviously the blood-curdling bellows of your guy's vocalist, Drew, uh, yeah. who sounds like, I mean, he sounds just like an offspring of, like, Robert Plant, you know, that fucked Janis Joplin or something. I mean, <laughs> I mean, he just has that real, I mean, old school bellow like that. I mean, he, I mean, and on that track especially, I really think he displays his vocal prowess especially well on that one. I think Drew, I think he knew our bass player Davis. Um, I think that he was brought on after a few rehearsals that me, Davis, and Jarrett had done with a, a different drummer, Barrett. Um, okay. So he's been on since the beginning. I think that they met up in New York at a point. Drew actually lived down here in Philly for a little bit during the early stages of the band. Okay. <laughs> Well, now, in, just going back to in terms of recording live to tape, I mean, how much of a, I would say, a positive effect does it have when you're recording that way in terms of playing those songs live? I, I would have to think it makes it that much easier for it to sound the same live as it does on the record. I mean, is that, would that be true? What do you guys say? I mean, like, with with live, you're just dealing with, like, bad, bad PAs. A lot of times you can't hear yourself live. So, like, mm. a lot of times, like, you know, singers can have a, a worse performance because they just can't hear themselves mm -hmm. and uh but recording live i mean the coolest thing about recording live is just like the sound you get like especially just from the, the, the drums man like all the frequencies on the on everything dude yeah it's, it's the capture it all yeah, the space yeah. man like if you get the sound of an actual room have a hellishly loud thing going on it's kind of different you get spoiled in a studio, man, because you can hear really well, and uh, there isn't mm -hmm. like you're not fighting sounds on stage and feedback and stuff like that, man. So I think like sometimes, yeah, Drew, you know, he, you know, struggles sometimes yeah, live when there's you know? there's two it half stacks sucks. and an eight ten cab right there blaring behind it's you. So loud, shit. man. The stage mm -hmm. volume of Grey Banners is insanely loud, so it's just <laughs> keeping up. It's gnarly. Sure. Well, I'm sure one of the reasons for that too is is using those orange amps. And of course, you guys, your latest video and single for the song Mongoloid Supreme, uh, part of that Jam in the Van series, uh, you know, sponsored by Orange. But unlike the other bands that I saw in artists that are part of that Jam in the uh, in the Van, you guys, it, it was Jam in the Church. But you guys, man, as you record the video in an actual church, um. Tell us about, I guess, the video and how you guys wound up hooking up with Orange and Jim the van, and, and what made you do the video in a church rather than the van that most do, obviously, on on that uh, on the uh, website. So I don't know for like two and a half years, between Gray Bathers and me playing in Heavy Temple and just posting a lot about Orange and loving those amps, like I just kept hitting them up, sending them stuff from the bands, photos, and all that, and. Uh, I don't know, eventually something happened where they were like, all right, cool, we could, we could bring you on. And then eventually both bands got endorsed. So just in, like throughout the pandemic, they had to stop doing the actual jam in the van. 
mm-hmm. thing. Um, and they started doing uh, remote sessions, which kind of mm-hmm. gave everyone the freedom to do their sessions wherever they wanted. Um, Davis had been working with this guy, Thomas, at the studio that's in the church. Okay. Um, so he had done some sessions there. And it just seemed like the perfect place for us to do our session. Um, mm-hmm. So he linked that all up. We got Mike, uh, who shot the entire recording process for us in Memphis as well. Okay. So he ended up doing the filming. Uh, Davis kind of got that all set up and made it happen. Um, why we chose the church, I don't know. I feel like it was just like we got to choose songs from the album that I think would have sounded best in that environment with that natural reverb. Like okay. The sound in that room was just insane. And also these songs have evolved so much since we recorded them. Like it just, it seemed like the perfect location for it. You know? Sure. talk a little bit about your guys scene here we're speaking about scenes philly uh you know right now um to me no doubt i think it's ground zero on the east coast of the u.s for this type of music got heavy temple obviously jared you're the band i mean high reaper ecstatic vision i mean just a a shitload of great bands out of the area man so talk a little bit about the philly scene and why do you you guys think that this kind of music really in the scene itself is really burgeoning right now it's such a hot spot Especially considering, I mean, just from my, you know, just knowing what I know about Philly music, it's usually, traditionally, I know there's a lot of, obviously, 80s, a lot of 80s rock bands were big out of there, a lot of hardcore extreme metal. But usually when you think of Philly, you don't think of this type of 70s type of sound. So what's what's going on in the scene there that's such a burgeoning, you know, uh, city right now for the 70s inspired rock? Uh, medicinal weed. <laughs> oh, all right. That, that sure helps. <laughs> 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 I don't know. I, I feel like everyone's also kind of growing. Uh, and most of these people have been playing in bands. There's also a lot of like Delaware transplants up to Philly. Mm. And everybody's just been like in this kind of incestuous scene, even in Delaware. Um, you know, like some of those bands you, you mentioned, like even like High Reaper and mm-hmm. Heavy Temple and, you know, a few of the guys even from Grey Bathers, like we all started kind of in Delaware and then we moved up to Philly. So we've all been kind of growing, I guess, together, but separately. Uh, And it just makes sense, man. It's the best kind of music to be playing. Not to put anything else down, but Mm -hmm. I don't know. Grow the fuck up and play some metal. (laughs) Well, like I said before, I mean, the record's getting, I mean, it's getting a lot of attention, guys. You know, um, I know you guys had some, you know, dates you've been playing. What's up next for you guys? Are you going to continue to tour the U.S. or maybe possibly overseas to the festivals. What are you guys looking to do next with the band? Who? Uh, well, we're kind of in a weird spot right now where we got to do some lineup changes. Uh, you know, we don't need to go okay. into full detail or whatever, but mm-hmm. I think that the next thing, obviously, is to, to fix that and then see what happens and what this next iteration of this band looks like. Uh, but, yeah, absolutely getting back on the road. 
Oh, selling all through all through these records and getting these records in as many people's hands as possible. Um, I think that's that's the top of the list right now. And eventually getting back to a nice like routine where we can get to recording the next album. You know? All right, sounds good. Keep it keep it mostly simple. Absolutely, man. Well, Grey Bathers is the band. Rock and Roll Fetish is the album. It's out now on Seeing Red Records. And uh, guys, where should we send our listeners to keep up with the band in terms of tour dates, merch, and anything else that's going on with the band right now? Um, let's send them to our Instagram where they can actually check out the link tree, which has links to our band camp. Um, yeah, band camp's always the way to go as far as um, you know, getting money directly into the band's pockets absolutely mm. uh, but also just follow us along on instagram and stuff we're still posting ridiculous pictures of amps and and gear porn and mm. just stupid shenanigans <laughs> all right fantastic well, once again rock and roll fetish debut full length from philadelphia's gray bathers and guys i think you know thanks so much for coming on good luck with everything man i hope we see you uh you know Soon on the road, I'd love to check you guys out here on the West Coast uh, if you ever get out here. Hopefully yeah, soon. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Okay, dude. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, us. guys. Who cut leather and the horse had jacket?